All right, welcome back from break. So uh, by my scorecard, I'm the third Kevin of the morning, which uh, it's always good to have a plethora of Kevins because then later on today, whenever I hear anyone compliment something Kevin said, I'll think it was me that they were talking about. So that's, that's good. Um, but I am the uh, CTO of the Americas at Siena. I've been with Siena for about six and a half years. And I joined Siena really to help out on new things at Siena, not, not really, not so much the traditional optical networking business. Of course, you get more and more involved with that over time, no matter, no matter what you're doing. But I, uh, for a while, I led the uh, first software division where a lot of this automation technology and NFE and that that I'm going to talk about today came out of. And then also uh, prior to that, I led product management for all of the uh, kind of MPLS, IP, and Ethernet platforms as well across the company. So kind of interesting background at Siena. When I was asked to give this talk, I said, you know, I think I gave a talk uh, at the MEF a few years ago. Of course, I thought it was maybe two years ago, but it was three years ago. And uh, in November of 2015, I stood on the stage. I think we were in Dallas back then. And I talked about three things that would not change over the next few years and how they actually may place even greater demands on all the decisions we make each day in our jobs. Those three things were the need to do more with less, the need for speed, and the need for seamless connectivity. So it's always fun when you give a talk, especially about technology and trends, and then you come back a few years later and you can kind of scorecard it and look back on it. So we're going to look at these three trends and, uh, and look at um, some real lessons learned, some practical lessons learned. And then we're going to talk about some more things and some more practical lessons learned too. So all in about 15 minutes or so. So the need to do more with less. I mean, we can all relate to this trend, right? It's, it's kind of uh, in our day-to-day -day lives as mobile users, um, we all probably have uh, unlimited data on our mobile devices. And if you're a service provider, you know, you've lived the journey of the need to do more with less. You literally are called upon to deliver more services while not having more revenue per user from your, uh, from your subscribers, right? You're, everyone's consuming more data. You have to figure out how to do more with less. Well, when we look back at networks function virtualization and the lessons learned during the last three years, it really breaks the more for less rule. I mean, NFV, the beginning of the journey is really more for more. And candidly, maybe at the very start of the journey, it's less for more, right? It's pretty darn complex. I know a lot of folks in the audience have scars on them from, you know, getting different virtual network functions to run in an open stack environment or whatever environment they're particularly running in. I think, you know, initially your OPEX is likely to increase because you have to go out and you have to hire oftentimes, not always, but you do have to hire new expertise, new software expertise, perhaps into your network domain. Uh, standardization and all the work that the MEF is doing, fantastic, definitely helping a great deal in the journey, and we've come a long way in three years. You do have this investment in the beginning more right? You, you spend more in the beginning, but at the end, you have a much more powerful platform, a much more flexible platform to deploy your services off, off of. Some of the lessons learned are, you know, be bold, especially the product folks in the audience. Be bold about trying out something new and maybe pushing a new brand on your sales force of a virtual network function, because not all VNFs are created equally. So what I specifically mean is, your sales force may be used to selling a certain physical uh, function, a metal box that provides a certain function, but it turns out the virtual version of that brand doesn't work too well. So, you know, if you want to accelerate your journey, be bold and be willing to switch to a different brand, maybe, maybe something that performs uh, at a higher level in its software flavor. And then very importantly, because this is a, initially a more for more journey, um, you know, you, you want to be able to ideally use a business case that allows you to sell new services or win new customers. You know, maybe customers that are outside of your footprint. 
maybe customers that are a lower tier business customer than you normally go after. And this way, if it costs you a little bit more in the beginning, either from both an OPEX or from an OPEX standpoint or a CAPEX standpoint or both, um, you're actually able to add new business on the top line and trickle it through to the bottom line, rather than just converting physical devices to virtual devices. The second trend is the need for speed. So I think we can relate to this as well. You know, there's much more competition in the market today for service providers. And you know, what happens and what, what our service provider partners tell me about almost on a daily basis is if they're not able to close a new opportunity with a business customer quickly, there's a significant opportunity to lose that business to, to the competition. So as a result, service providers are looking more and more to automate the process of provisioning new services. And you know, you've seen some of our customers come out publicly and talk about now being able to uh, provision automatically wavelengths in minutes instead of weeks or months or days or whatever their unit of measure is, uh, depending on the particular service provider. Well, what we've learned about the need for speed from our hyperscale uh, partners is that you know, they start planning for automation before, you know, right at the point where they're coming up with a new idea for a new service. And although this is a general statement, you know, I, I, I think it's uh, vastly true, is that more traditional service providers compared to the hyperscale ones wait for the success or large scale success of a new service before they start to think about pulling the OPEX out of it. And what we've learned over the last three years, of course, much easier to automate if you're thinking about it from the beginning of the process than going in and kind of bolting on automation at the end when you already have a large scale service in place. Very interestingly, another lesson learned, when we started the journey, and of course you have to put together a business case, you work with your service provider partner on a business case, folks thought that OPEX would be the key lever, the key driver in the business case. And it's actually revenue acceleration was the most, most significant lever over the past three years. So the ability to provision services much more quickly allows the service provider to pull in revenue that was on the near-term near -term horizon pull it into today or tomorrow or next week instead. So that revenue acceleration, that's actually the biggest lever in the business case. All right, the need for seamless connectivity, the last trend from three years ago. So, you know, this is all around us and we, we evidence of the need for seamless connectivity. And what I mean by that is basically at the, at the highest level, allowing someone like myself or yourself to have the same connectivity to whatever application, whatever service we want to access, same network response time, same availability, same reliability, same security, wherever we are in the world, whatever device we're on. And if we go back to the MEF last year, uh, I think we were down in Orlando, we saw the first evidence that I recall of the POX related to carrier to carrier connectivity, uh, whether it be uh, traditional carrier to traditional carrier, or even into uh, some of the uh, cloud service providers as well. And when you go upstairs, uh, you know, this afternoon, this evening, and you look at the POX, you just see a lot more of that than you did see back in November. So it's pretty exciting and definitely a requirement for, uh, for large-scale deployment. All right, this one, this one wasn't on the docket three years ago, but it's certainly been part of the lesson learned. So open source versus open architecture. So, you know, the slide, the title says versus, but it's really not an either or an or. You know, what we've seen over the last three years, whether you know it or not, open source is all around us. Open source is leveraged on the phone that's in your pocket. It's leveraged on the laptop that's in your briefcase. Um, it is a workforce multiplier. There's no debate, no debate about it at all. But what we've seen over the last three years it, is that you know, service providers definitely want to leverage open source, and if they don't, they should. Um, but at the same time, there's a lot more development that has to go on with the open source. So then we get to an open architecture. So wh what do I really mean by that? I mean that it's really valuable if a service provider can leverage open source and then ideally work in a DevOps environment with their partner, with their vendor. 
So the vendor gives them an open environment for them to even write their own code in. Why is this important? Well, the service provider obviously wants to go on the journey. They want to go on the journey. Why is it important for both the partner and the service provider to be there? Well, then in a practical lesson from the past three years, the service provider has a backstop. You know, maybe when things don't go as fast as they need them to go, then they have someone to lean on. They have a partner that has skin, on the, skin in the game with them. Maybe when they go GA with their new service, they have a partner to lean on so that they don't have to answer the phone in the middle of the night uh, for a national service when there's a problem, right? And then very importantly, a lot of you that are service providers in the audience, you know that when you took on this journey, you already had a full-time job. You know, you jumped into it and your people jumped into it with a lot of enthusiasm because it's a great learning, it's where the world is going, and we all should, you know, continue to develop, of course, but you still have your full-time job to do. So it's great to have a partner there as a backstop. The other lesson we learned is that some domains uh, yield a lot uh, faster fruit, so to speak, in terms of automation. So, you know, some of the first things we automated were wavelength services, right? It's Sienna, Sienna Blue Planet, right? Of course, we're going to automate wavelength services. But what we've learned over the last three years is when you're automating a service like Ethernet services, you can actually get much quicker returns on the service because Ethernet by nature is over-provisioned. Right? You have a lot more bandwidth available typically in an Ethernet, MPLS, IP network, so that when you go out and automate instant turnup of a new service, the service is there, the network is there for you to tap into that service instead of waiting for new line cards to arrive and be installed into an exchange or a central office. All right, very important lesson here. We heard about it a little bit this morning. Embrace hyperscale development environments. So, you know, you look at an example here from uh, AWS that I have on the slide. You know, AWS has gone to the edge with uh, code like Greengrass. Anyone know Greengrass? Not the Greengrass in Colorado. But, but uh, you know, Greengrass is basically their version, their software to go out on edge devices to allow uh, additional functionality to be put on the devices, kind of like a, an open stack of sorts, right? And, you have a question now as you play in the hyperscale development environment, you know, are you going to run Azure's tools, AWS's tools, Google Cloud tools, all of the above maybe. But the important thing is don't, do not not jump into the hyperscale pool. You have to jump in. And if you don't jump in, you know, maybe over the top is a good thing, like we heard this morning, but it'd be much better to participate in the over the top journey, especially if the hyperscale folks come down and start, uh, start running these applications across the network. I think it would be better as a service provider to be a part of that journey. All right, what else have we seen over the last three years? Well, we've definitely seen leveraging um, big data analytics and advanced telemetry from uh, newer networking devices uh, to, to manage adaptive behavior. So, you know, we're, we're really moving now and have moved, there's real use cases out there with service providers from a reactive network into a proactive network. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit more in a second. But reactive, right, networks have always been able to recover very quickly to problems, whether they're ring-based or mesh-based, global networks or metro networks, they're very strong at recovering, whether it's a fiber break, a router hangs up, whatever it is, they're very quickly at saying, okay, here's my primary path, that's down, now I'm automatically going to the secondary path. But what am I talking about when I talk about proactive networks? So in proactive, it's a little bit more like the application ways that you all have on your phone, right? So if you're going down to the airport, on Thursday and you're on the 405, Waze doesn't just tell you that there's a problem on the 405, so you should take the five, right? It looks at the telemetry of the road system, of all the vehicles there, and it makes an intelligent recommendation of what you should do before you decide to do it. So it's not purely reactive. It's able to look ahead, look further into the network. When it starts to see a problem, maybe the problem isn't there yet, starts to sense a problem, and then it makes a recommendation of what should be done in order to proactively address the problem that's either coming up or that literally has arisen. So if we look at that more practically in a network environment, you know, it comes about with 
three different steps. You know, it's kind of an easy way to remember it. So it's, it's of course, you have this infrastructure, whatever it is. It could be white boxes. It could be vendor-specific boxes. could be a combination of the two. But you think of it as that's the traditional network. That's the connect in the equation. And then you move on into the sensing, right? The brain that's listening and looking at traditional telemetry and of course advanced telemetry that comes out of you know, next generation silicon that's out there in the market. And then finally, you know, the most important part is where these controllers are, where this automation software is, is you can have these policies that are set. You see that intent-based policies note, and then you're actually taking action based on the telemetry that was forward up and the big data analytics that's analyzing this telemetry across the entire network, maybe even across news events and things like that, if there's a natural disaster going on and things like that, and then taking action, recommending or actually just provisioning an alternative path through the network. What else has changed? I mean, bandwidth inversion across the network, nothing is the same even in the last three years. You know, what we've seen and a lot of you have seen in the room is that years back, and I don't mean 20 years ago, like five years ago, we were selling much more bandwidth into the core of networks. And you were consuming a lot more bandwidth into the core of networks. And then in the last few years, it's kind of all at the edge. The edge is getting much smarter. The edge, the metro is getting a ton more bandwidth. The device is, you know, we, we talk out of both sides of our mouth in the community, right? We want um, white boxes, which are fantastic, you know, certain things, but then we also need specialized platforms, especially in the access network to address things like 5G that are coming where you have to handle so much more connectivity and so much more bandwidth, but do it at the right economic price, right? Because of that more for less problem I, I, I addressed before. It's a pleasure to be here three years ago and give a keynote and then be asked to come back and give another keynote and be able to reflect on what's happened. I thank all of you, you know, in the audience that are our partners and especially our customers uh, for, for going on the journey with us and helping us on the journey. And hopefully uh, we were able to help you along the way too. Thank you. <laughs>